Hi, welcome back to Middle East Apologetics. We had finished up our last series dealing with Daniel Rogers' book, The Last Enemy, and now we will be diving into the major issues of Alan Bondar's book, uh, be The Journey Between the Veils. Now, we've talked about uh, different theologies and different things before that, and uh, some of the most basic ones that we have to address and uh, explain, it seems like, over and over again, because, uh, well, Predators are not going to actually listen to us and learn from us um, when we talk about certain theologies that were set um, by the early church and have been agreed to and understood for, for thousands of years. You know, um, they have to rewrite and define every, every one of them, um, from anthropology, soteriology, uh, Christology, um, and of course eschatology. Everything has to be changed because it's all being forced to fit into a 70 AD. And so the implications and the things that are being said directly are being all applied to that date, uh, whether they fit or not. Uh, so what we do and what we're doing here is going through and looking at some of those arguments and the things that they present and uh, compared, of course, to uh, the traditional understandings and theologies and, and dealing it with from that perspective and showing the contrasts of that and why um, logically or consistently the full predators paradigm consistently fails um, and, and falls apart. So over these next few videos of course we're going to be dealing with his his book and basically what his book is is that you know he's presenting a theology based on a typology meaning he's looking at the Old Testament uh, development of the tabernacle and how the, on the Day of the Atonement, the sacrifices were carried out. And, and then he brings them into the New Testament, as Hebrews 9.10 does, and talks about Christ and his sacrifice, and then tries to use that typology to explain Hebrews and explain things um, and that connection. And the fact is, though, that the writer of Hebrews did a very wonderful job in explaining things, but, of course, Bonder adds to that. See, now, one of the things that he's claiming is that... Uh, the first veil is the one that was ripped from top to bottom, not the second one. And so that we have uh, 40 cubits between uh, the first veil and the second veil. The first place, uh, the first veil marking off where the priests work. And then, of course, the second veil is where the Holy of Holies was, where Christ's presence dwelt. And so basically what he is arguing for uh, all the way through across, of course, is that uh, Christ does not have his body. That's, I mean... Hands down, that is the uh, the primary thing that he's arguing for, and he's going to uh, use the typology to prove that point and to prove that case. And of course, this is something that's never been by done by any theologian ever before. You cannot go to any other preterist and find a theology about between the veils or a study of the typology in that sense, or can you really go to um, any kind of modern or futurist theologian, I would say, and find that kind of typology that he's presenting here um, presented. Now, he tries to quote some people and say that is there, um, but of course, he's mistaking what the quotes say and, and misunderstanding the ap full application because um, he's got to put it into his perspective, not into the futurist perspective of which that person wrote to begin with. Um, he's taking what they said and then putting it into his paradigm and thinking that somehow that it, it fits. And, of course, it, it just doesn't. Now, in dealing with this book, one of the first things that I want to bring out and notice is that a lot of the arguments that he brings out are, um, unfortunately, based on uneducated declarations by people who are less than familiar with theology of the church for the last thousand years. You know, I mean, for example, arguing from Acts 1, 9 through 11, that like manner means that it's teaching a bodily coming. Uh, but in fact, that verse there has nothing to do with physical body coming. It's not talking about the physical coming. When it says like matter, how did he leave? He left from the earth into the sky and a cloud received him and he disappeared. Well, if he's going to return in a like manner, that means he's coming out of the clouds uh, back to earth. That's all that is being applied, that he will return in the same way. It does not demand that the same crowd is there, that he does it in the same way, or, you know, as Revelation talks about riding on a horse. That doesn't mean that there's 
there's a contradiction there. It just means that he comes out of heaven to earth. Um, and it never teaches exactly that. So, But yet, people will argue that. And the question is, is why? Why would somebody um, argue that way? And it's because the church has understood that uh, Christ exists in heaven, in bodily form, with a glorious body. Now, those are two main scriptures that we deal with and he talks about. Uh, but, of course, he has to change the uh, those wording to body of Christ and not uh, the biological body. That's where he gets from. And, of course, in the process of exegesis, that is just simply cannot um, be sustained as a valid interpretation based on exegesis. So, uh, to begin with, on page 15, um, you know, so, like I said, this is a book about the body of Christ. More specifically, it is a book about the physical, fleshly body of Christ, and even more specifically, it's a book about demonstrating that Christ no longer has, nor ever will again have, his physical body that he has between his birth and his extension. And, of course, the church has taught for 2,000 years that, of course, that he exists in heaven in bodily form. And that does not change and has never changed. And we give the arguments why. Uh, when you go through the book, of course, Bonder never actually deals with uh, the main scriptures that he do, uh, that futurists have used to argue in a defense. He doesn't do that. He uses the things to argue for his position, but never as a defense against the futurist position or why they use those verses to prove their point. Um, so that becomes uh, very problematic when you do it in that in that way. Now. One what I want to get to, to begin with here, just this first video, is an overall thing about what he is talking about and how does Christ get rid of his body in heaven. Now, I want to point out a few quotes from him is what I'll do first. And uh, then we'll deal with more specifics. And I've pulled the quotes out here that are very pertinent to what we're talking about here. All right, here it is. Um, what we learn from these observations is, and now I'm pulling out quotes here, this is Ella Bondar speaking. Um, what we learn from these observations is that in order for the glory of Christ to be unveiled in heaven, Christ had to eliminate his physical body permanently at some point. Uh, so the idea is that Christ could not have a body. And the idea that he continues and hammers all the way through there is that if Jesus had a flesh body, there is no way that the glory of, of Christ can be revealed. The flesh uh, covers it up. It hides it. And uh, it becomes a veil in the sense of that it limits it. And so therefore, if you want to see the glory of God or if the glory of God wants to be manifested, then Jesus cannot be in his flesh. Bottom line. His next quote here, and it only makes sense that Christ would pick up his flesh again after his resurrection in order to take the 40 cubit journey because there is another veil blocking the way into heaven. Key. But when it is completed, the flesh of the animal is burned up by God's glory. I suggest to you that this is exactly what happened at the ascension of Christ as he entered the glory cloud on the mountain. Uh, of course, we'll talk about that. Christ is in the temple of of God being dedicated. He is also the burnt offering of dedication. Get that. Also the burnt offering. Uh, in the verses that follow from Acts 1 through 9, Christ descends through glory and the glory cloud where his body is consumed and he ascends to the throne to reign for 40 years until the time of restoration. Hmm. Christ is the sacrifice that shed his blood so that as our high priest, he could carry his blood into the holy place by picking up his body again through resurrection and becoming the burnt offering that removes the second veil as he enters into glory cloud, thus bringing his blood through the second veil since he is the mercy seat. But of course, his flesh is burnt up. So that was the point of the body of Christ the second time, to be sacrificed and consumed by the fire of God. Um, let's see if there was any else I wanted. No. 
So here's the whole point of the whole book is that Christ does not have his body anymore. It got burnt up. And here's my observation. He was raised in a flesh and bone body, a physical body, um, as Paul also states what? We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So when we talk about like Lazarus was resurrected, he came back to life, but what happened to him? He died again. Um, and so definition of death is, um, according to James 2.6, is when the body and the spirit separate. That is physical death. That is the definition of physical death. So Christ being raised from the dead, being body, soul, and spirit, and now lives forever, cannot die again. So if the definition of physical death is the separation of body and spirit, then Christ's body cannot die again, like Lazarus did or anybody else. That is what the first says. Um, this is Romans 6, 9. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Now, I want you to look at the tense of that. Will never, future, die again. So this means that he is alive right now. Um, in order for him to be alive, and he claims in even Revelation, you know, I died and I live forevermore. Well, what was it that lived again was the body. He is alive again, living in that body. Um, and if that body dies a second time, that means the spirit separated from that body, and that body experienced a second death. Uh, I want to get specific here. Uh, I didn't put it down. Um, so basically what he did, when I tried to argue with him and talk to him personally about that, the, the idea of him dying twice, Bonder responded back, and he basically said, um, your attempt to force me to state that Christ died twice is intentionally ignoring, for the purpose of making a straw man argument, the multifaceted definition of death. You as well as I believe that there is spiritual death and physical death. Uh, but when Bontar talks about the body being raised up the first time after being killed on the cross and then going into heaven and getting burned up again, that's still physical death. There is no contrast there between a spiritual death and a physical death. They're both being um, physically killed. You can't say a body is burned up is a spiritual death uh, because it involves the biological body and it cannot be uh, consumed. Um, and he says, becoming the burnt offering that removes the second veil. Well, the first veil was removed by his first death. Uh, now the second one is removed by him being a sacrifice, a burnt offering, which means that he has to die again. Uh, where did Jesus complete the burnt offerings? It could only be at the ascension. It was sacrificed, poured out, and then burned by the fire of God's Shekinah glory. Jesus did not enter the Holy Holies with his body. His body was consumed by the glory crowd. Um... All of those things that he he quotes in his book, um, in open, order to open the first veil, Christ had to tear his flesh so that man can draw near to God. Thus, his crucifixion took care of the first veil, but then he picks up his flesh again to take the 40-cubit journey, which is the 40 days between his resurrection and ascension, and he is also the burnt offering of dedication. Um, that's not talking about a spiritual death. It's talking about two physical deaths. Uh, his body is consumed. Um, let me see, what other quotes? So, okay, well, the point then is, of course, is that you're, you're singing. He's not talking about spiritual death. He's talking about um, physical. So in your view, atonement for sin was not achieved on the cross. And this is why this is so dangerous and why I wanted to bring this up. If atonement was completed by his death on the cross and him entering into with his blood, then the atonement was complete. The picture of the veil being torn in two means that Christ accepted that blood sacrifice. Uh, that did not mean he had to enter into heaven and present it to God and say, here's my blood. Uh, literally, um, it was poured out and shed uh, on the cross. 
and then the veil rent in two. So what does that mean? If the veil rent in two, that means then the way between God and man has been separated. Why? Because the sacrifice has been made. There is no other sacrifice that needs to be made. Um, it can't. Uh, you, you can't do it again. You can't do it up twice. It says a single offering, Hebrews 10, 14. For a, by a single offering is prefer, perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Alan Bonder in his book, You Have Jesus Dying Twice as an Offering. One is the sin offering and one is the burnt offering. Uh, so to fill the typology where the first body was killed on the cross and it's raised and becomes a burnt offering, that's two offerings. So I didn't create a straw man when I brought this up, and that is the challenge um, for anybody who's sitting there reading and paying attention and following along. Did Jesus Christ have to die twice, or does it, as it says, he died only once? Um, if you read Alan's book, you'll get across uh, from the quota that he, uh, Christ's resurrected body had to be consumed a second time. And um, that just simply uh, goes against Scripture. So we're going to dive into a little bit more of his other quotes and then some of the other things that he said and deal with the uh, logical arguments that he presents in his, or I should say little illogical arguments that he presents in his book. Uh, so thanks for watching. Thanks for uh, subscribing. Um, pass it on to other people as we start this uh, journey between the bay.